30s. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second week of the Bordeaux box. And today, we're tasting this little guy, so cute, little half bottle. Domaine La Clos Casali is the same producer that we tasted last week, but it's their so turn. This is what they're really known for. Last week is that, you know, as we talked about, one hectare of the vineyard, they really just dedicated to making um, dry white wine. But really what they're known for is Sauterne, the noble Sauterne. Um, so that's what we're tasting today. Uh, just a few announcements before we get started. <clears throat> uh, it is the last call for the Case Club. Uh, I'm going to close the Case Club tomorrow. Uh, so uh, if you, this is for the last month, so all the Austrian wines, the Hot Rod and, and Donna Riesling and you know, all that Austrian stuff. Uh, if you want to participate in that, you, this is your last chance. Get your orders in now so we can get that all wrapped up. Uh, second, tomorrow is the 15th, which means the invoices are going to go out tomorrow. But because of February being a shorter month, uh, I need to wrap those invoices up very quickly. So for those of you who are not joining us next month, if you could just let me know uh, as soon as the invoices kick out or just even now, just shoot me an email and let me know. That'd be fantastic, particularly those of you who are, can get your wines shipped. If you could let me know, I would appreciate it because I need to wrap that up quite quickly. Uh, I'll probably start this weekend. I'll probably start hitting you guys up for to wrap up the enrollment because it's going to be a quick turnaround. It's going to be about a week. I need to wrap it all up by next Wednesday. So it's got about a one week. So help me out and let me know or just pay the invoice if you want to. Uh, you should have seen my email that went out yesterday, but Wine Prom is coming at the end of April. Um, if you could just email me and let me know whether you plan on attending or not, I would appreciate it. I just just trying to get a not a not a commitment thing. It's just I'm just trying to get a rough headcount of how many people to expect, and you know, just for planning purposes. So if you could RSVP, I would appreciate it. Uh, just just directly to that email, you can just write back and then let me know. That I would appreciate it. Uh, some of you caught this, but uh, next month uh, theme is going to be Riesling Box 2.0. But we're going to do a, a horizontal tasting of German Riesling. So we're going to going back to Germany. So it's all Riesling from Germany, not from any other countries. But last time we did just Mosel Valley, and then we did it through different sugar level, right? Different ripeness level. But this time we're going to do Riesling, but we're going to taste it through. Mosul versus Rangau versus Rheinhessen versus Nahe versus Faults, just kind of show the range of style that exists even within German Riesling. Um, and, you know, so selfishly speaking, I just want to drink some Riesling. So I figure I'm just going to put together a Riesling box. So that's really what's happening. Um, and last but not least, We're donating to the Hunger Project this month. Uh, if you want to check out what they do, and if you want to donate alongside Six Foot Wine Club, the link is right there in the chat box. Otherwise, it's all cool too. If you can't, if you can't, or you don't want to. Uh, any questions about anything? I just want to work. We get into the wine. In case you are also wondering, the wine prom is going to take place in the Black Nile this year. It's going to be at Ian's office where Julia and Dan got married and had their reception. So it's a cool space. Uh, all right. The end, hearing no questions, let's start. Wait, where, where did you say it? it's going to be? It's going to be in Ian's office in Black Denali. His office is called, or his company is called Development Seed. It's right next to the Dabney. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And gonna they're going to, and we're going to party in their office. Yeah. It's like an office, but it's like this open space, like exposed brick wall, like one of those, like a uh, hipster offices that have like a kitchen in there. Like it's, it's cool. It's dope. But yes, we're, we're going to take, gonna take over his office. Excellent. All right. Cool. Yep. Yep. Uh, all right. So. Uh, here's a map of France. Um, we're right here, right? Bordeaux, southwest of France. Take quick, 
technically this is called Southwest, but it's in the Southwest part of France, but Bordeaux is right here, right butting up right against the Atlantic Ocean, right? These two rivers, we talked about this last week, Dordogne and Garonne River, these two, uh, and then this estuary running into the Atlantic Ocean, this proximity to the ocean is essentially what makes viticulture here possible. Um, it has all that moderating influence here. Uh, it does have some problem with humidity because of that, but as you will see later on with Sauterne, that humidity is actually uh, beneficial and it's exactly what makes production of Sauterne possible here. But this is where we are, Bordeaux, the great Bordeaux named after the city of Bordeaux. Um, that's right here. Uh, if you look more closely, where is it? Here we are. This is where we are, right? Last week we covered this, uh, but it's basically the Bordeaux is kind of roughly divided into three different regions. Um, geographically speaking, right? There's a left bank and the right bank. Left bank is basically on the left side of the Garonne River. The right bank is on the right side of the Dordogne River. And then Anche de Mer, which is between the two seas, in the middle right here, this kind of a turquoise color place. This is in the middle between the two rivers. Um, left and right bank, pretty much red wine production. In the middle is where the white wine comes from. And this is just all just some review. Uh, these are the red varieties of Bordeaux, Cabernet Sauvignon Merlot, Cabernet Franc, Petit Bordeaux, Carbonair, and Malbec, right? Being from the left, Medoc, this is where some of the greatest, probably some of the most expensive wines of uh, of Bordeaux come from, right? You might've heard some of these names, Saint Estef, Oyac, Saint Julien, Medoc, these places, Margot. Um, Left bank is pretty much Cabernet Sauvignon dominant blend. And then right bank is all Merlot dominant blend. You might have heard some of these names, Pomerol, right? saint Emilion. This is where we're going to be last next two weeks on the right bank. So we're going to be drinking Merlot-based red wines uh, for the last two weeks of this month. And in the middle here is where all the white wine comes from. And for the white wine, we're talking about Sauvignon Blanc, Semillon, Muscadel. Um, so those of you who are Sauvignon Blanc friends from New Zealand, I highly recommend you check out some Sauvignon Blanc from uh, from Bordeaux. Um, I, I like it quite a bit, actually. Uh, very different style than New Zealand or Loire Valley. Uh, it, it's a it's much rounder, um, uh, much more floral. It's less austere, uh, but uh, yeah, it's a it's a cool expression here. But today, where we are is just like where we were last week because we're talking to the same producer here, Barsak. So this or, uh, yellow area right here is where the world, arguably the world's greatest dessert wine is produced. And earlier I said how humidity is what makes it possible here, right? The what makes this great uh, dessert wine possible is this rot. There's a particular type of rot called botrytis, uh, also known as the noble rot. It's only caused by a very humid kind of like foggy conditions that comes in the autumn time. And then by afternoon, the sun comes and dries up the uh, fog. But that early day humidity and fog uh, coupled with that clearing of the sunshine in the afternoon and a certain temperature, that condition, that's usually caused by this river. And as you can see, this river runs right through these vineyards is what causes, what makes that noble rock possible, um, that humidity. Uh, Barsak, this whole Sauternes area, is essentially where this white dessert wine, uh, no botrytis affected Sauvignon Blanc, uh, actually Semillon is mostly Semillon. It used to be Sauvignon Blanc back in the days, but these days Semillon has kind of taken over as a majority grape variety, the main grape variety, but Semillon-based botrytis affected dessert wine. Some of the world's greatest, most age-worthy uh, white dessert wines come from this region right here. Uh, just wanted to go over some rules. Uh, you know, I, I said last week that there's so many different ways to dissect uh, Bordeaux. Um, so I think I'm going to try to give you a little bite-sized chunk each week. Uh, last week, uh, so we did all that review of last week, which is left bank, right bank, both red wine, 
that banks covered is often dominant, right banks are more dominant, white wine in the middle, dessert wines come from, sweet wines come from right here in the yellow part. So today we're gonna to talk about the appellation system a bit. So there are 39 individual appellations in Bordeaux. There are three regional appellations. There's a Bordeaux, Bordeaux Superior, Cremant de Bordeaux. Uh, if you ever go to any wine store that carries Bordeaux, you, you're gonna see all these three uh, appellations. Bordeaux being, you can the wine can come from anywhere within Bordeaux, it can be sourced anywhere. Uh, Bordeaux Superior is a certain parts um, that you can see. Uh, it's usually more to do with uh, the uh, production method and the farming method. There's more restrictions like a uh, yield uh, control on the yield or cap on the yield, uh, higher alcohol usually. Um, so that's Bordeaux superior. It's not necessarily means better than Bordeaux. It's just that there's more control placed, regulation placed on its production. Cremante Bordeaux is basically traditional method sparkling wine that's made from Bordeaux. So those are three are like the regional ones. Uh, can come from anywhere within Bordeaux. There's a middle tier that represents whole kind of subregion. So Medoc, this whole can be sourced from anywhere within this uh, red area, right? Medoc. Anche du Mer, those are talking about this whole turquoise area. Uh, Cote de Bordeaux are groupings of uh, some of these different uh, uh, Bordeaux villages or communes that are basically on a hillside. So there's groupings of these kind of regional uh, things you see. Uh, and then there's a village applications, or it should be quote unquote village applications. Uh, this may cover single commune like Pomerol. So if you look at Pomerol here, this is a single commune. Um, the only wines, grapes that are sourced from this little tiny region can be called Pomerol, right? But oftentimes they cover a cluster of small communities under the banner of a single village. So what does that exactly mean? So turn is a, such an example. Uh, so, for example, this right here, Sautern is right here, but Barsak is also right here. Uh, producers from Barsak can label their wines either Barsak or Sautern, however they want. They can choose either one. Um, so Sautern actually covers quite a few of these communes. Uh, kind of a grouping of these communes, and then people from producers from here can call their wine, choose to call their wine Sautern, or Barça, or Ceron, or Cadillac. But usually because Sautern is a, such a better, well-known, uh, more popular name, the recognizable name, most producers end up naming their wines Sautern instead of Barça. For example, this producer, they are in, uh, they are in Barça, and then all their fruits for this wine comes from Barça, but they call this Sautern because Sauternes just sells better. People just know what Sautern is. Uh, there's no currently no single vineyard or single estate appellations in Bordeaux, um, as you may see in Burgundy. Uh, however, there's one natural wine producer on the outskirts of the White Bank, uh, uh, Chateau Le Puy, which is actually a producer that makes the wine that we're tasting next week, the Duke Nob. Uh, they're currently petitioning to grant its own uh, appellation system uh, status just for their own uh, winery, uh, the kind of single vineyard uh, status. Uh, whether they get it granted or not is, remains to be seen, uh, but there's currently, as you speak uh, right now, like you see in Burgundy, there's no estate or there's no single vineyard appellation as you, can, you see. Uh, let's talk about 1855 classification system, because this is something, especially if you are around Bordeaux drinkers, you are going to, uh, undoubtedly hear about it all the time, because this is their fat, uh, favorite pastime, uh, conversations. Um, in advance of the 1855 Universal Expo, uh, that happened in Paris, basically Napoleon invited, the the merchants, uh, the Bordeaux Chamber of Commerce, essentially, uh, to select the region's best wines so they could represent it to the world. Uh, so they got together, quickly kind of drew up this list of top estates in Bordeaux. Uh, but the ranking was kind of based on price, not necessarily uh, uh, any kind of like a panel tasting or blind tasting or anything like that. And at the time, the red wines of Medoc here uh, and the sweet wines of Sautern carry the highest price tax at the time. So those were wines were basically got granted into the highest status within the classification. So these brokers selected 57 chateaus and divide them into five categories, 
you are always going to hear like first growth. Is that a second growth portal? Is that a first growth portal? You're going to hear terms like if you ever go out to like a company dinner and somebody is buying wine and they're like a huge Bordeaux person, they'll be, they'll be like, oh, this is a third growth that drinks like first growth. And what they're talking about is exactly this 1855 classification system. So these brokers selected 57 chateaus and divided them into five categories, first growth all the way to fifth growth or ground crew classe to fifth growth, uh, creating this kind of a hierarchy uh, of, of, uh, of uh, estates with chateaus. Uh, the first growth are Lafitte. You might've heard his name, Chateau Lafitte, Chateau Latour, Chateau Margaux, Chateau Aubryon. Uh, with an exception of Aubryon, basically all three of them are on the left bank right here in Meadow. Uh, these Cabernet Sauvignon based wines by these three, uh, these uh, producers, uh, they merit, they command premium, premium prices and consistently every year, some of the most sought after wines on the option block. Uh, and then brokers also chose 21 Saturn chateaus. Uh, again, because these were quite popular back then. Earlier, we we're talking about how popularity of street wine has fallen globally, not just here in America, but this is particularly true. Back in the days in 1800s, these sweet wines were very, very popular. Um, 21 Sauternes Chateaus, uh, and they got divided into three categories, uh, Premier Crew, Second Crew, and then one Premier Crew Superior, the top of the line. There's only one producer who got that top, top uh, level of that class, a sweet wine classification, which is Chateau de Camp. And you might've heard that name. Um, I'll put that in the chat box later. I can't type it right now, but uh, um, maybe I can. Yes, I can. Chateau. You might have seen Chateau de Kim. Uh, this is probably the most expensive Sauternes, the most ex exclusive sought after uh, dessert wines uh, in the world. Uh, so he that got the premier coup superior, but everybody also got divided into three different categories. Um, obviously, over time, a lot of these uh, producers kind of bought more properties. Uh, and then some of them went out of business. So the kind of uh, the number of chateau in this classification kind of changed over time. Uh, so today, uh, and then there's been some adjustment that has happened. Uh, so today there are 61 estates classified for red wine and 27 estates classified for white wines. But overall makeup of the 1855 classification remains essentially unchanged since the 1800s. Uh, with the one major exception that ever happened historically, uh, by the way, for just for the base level, basic level, uh, the introductory level for quartermaster sommelier's exam, I have we had to memorize every single one of these sixty-one estates just to give you the, if you ask me, waste of a brain space, but something we have to do. Uh, but uh, so yeah, it the remains. Uh, largely complete untouched, except for one change that happened. In 1973, the French Minister of Agriculture elevated second growth, you might have heard this name, Chateau Mouton Rothschild, to the status of premier classic. So it actually moved from second classic to the uh, first, second growth to the first growth. And that is the only time any chateau has ever been uh, promoted or has ever been devoted. Um, and ever since then, since 1855, everything else has remained exactly the same in the same classification. And even to the surprise of those authors, those uh, those merchants, brokers who made uh, wrote the 1855 classification system, this has been probably the most enduring, most static, and most famous classification that has remained in all of wine uh, over 150 years. It still exists and essentially in its original form. Um, as expected, the proponents. Typically, those houses, the Lafitte, Aubryon, those guys who benefit from being in the first growth, uh, hail the classification is unimpeachable and nobody can touch it. It's always the case and we will always produce the best wines because our land is the best, our vineyards are the best, uh, right? Then these detractors deride that it's basically outdated and useless and it just kind of uh, keeps people in its own um uh, it's basically uh, stuck in its own place. Uh, but for the rest of the wine world, particularly those Bordeaux collectors I was telling you about, and I've been around them for a long time, uh, especially having gone through wines in 
in you know late 90s and early 2000s and moving on, uh, this is their favorite debate to have. Uh, if the classifications were reimagined now, you know, how would it change? Who would move up? Who would move down? You know, does somebody deserve to be in the second row? This debate happens every single time you go to a Bordeaux dinner. And if you ever go to dinner with a Bordeaux person, expect to hear that debate because it's going to happen. Uh, there has been attempt to modernize this 1855 classification system as late as 1960s, uh, but it has never really gained any kind of traction. Um, Quite frankly, there's really not much incentive to really update this classification because the top producers who are in the first growth, uh, they're not interested in crowding the field, having more people move into the first class, right? They have their, basically they're sitting pretty in this first class. Uh, and then kind of this mediocre uh, second growth and third growth producers. By the way, there's some incredible, phenomenal producers in the second growth, third growth, even fourth and fifth growth. growth. But people who don't necessarily care, um, they're just kind of stuck in there and they they have no interest in losing their basically best PR that they have. Like they don't have to put out a great product, but they're forever in the second growth or the third growth status. So it never changes. So there's never really been any kind of incentive to change this classification system. And as you can probably imagine, I personally do not pay any kind of attention to this classification system. Uh, in fact, I find find it quite ironically hilarious that in you know, a country like France that was founded on a like, you know, revolution against the bourgeoisie and the aristocrat class that like, you know, they are so desperate holding on to this like old outdated system uh, and quite frankly, classes system. Uh, but, you know, this is Bordeaux. And this is why I talk about when you look at Burgundy versus Bordeaux, it's very different historically, even speaking, like, after all that revolution, the people, inventor, investors, and the wealthier folks ended up buying entire estates of Bordeaux and kept on hold on to it. As opposed to like if you look at Burgundy, the land was taken up by the state and divided into these heirs uh, to kind of divide up the uh, arist uh, aristocratic uh, land holdings. So there's this rigidity and classes kind of system still left over in Bordeaux and is still apparent and, and evidenced by this classification, that system that it still exists in Bordeaux versus places like Burgundy where none of it exists, where everything is very fractured. Um, so you decide for yourself whether this classification system benefits you as a consumer, right? Knowing that which producer has historically been uh, very popular and demanded commended high price, but doesn't necessarily mean it is that much better. Um, yeah, you decide for yourself whether the classification works, but I as a consumer and I as a as a wine slanger, slinger, uh, I have never really paid that much attention to the classification system. Um, so yeah, uh, let's talk about Sauternes, for example. So we're in that Barsak Sauternes area, um, made up of small communes, like I mentioned, right? Uh, the Sauternes AOP, the Appalachian is not just that one area of Sauternes, but all the grouping, like Barsak, for example, this producer is in our Barsak, but choose to call it Sauternes. Uh, all made by grape that is affected by Botrytis, which looks like this. So this is Botrytis. It looks bad, right? It looks like it's rotting and it's basically rotten grapes, and it is. Uh, that's essentially exactly what that is. Um, wait, hold on. Why can I do this? Can I do this? All right, here we go. Uh, here's another bunch. The whole bunch is affected by botrytis, right? Uh, and then here's a close up of that kind of rot that's happening. Um, there's a partially affected botrytis. Uh, so what happens is uh, the practice of making these sweet wines from botrytis fruit dates back to like at least early uh, 18th century. So since 1700s, uh, at the time it was held in high esteem by the rich Europeans. A lot of it went to uh, England. Uh, but also the Russian courts uh, in the 1800s really valued Sauternes wines. Um, and so much so that the wines of Sauternes were classified alongside those of the Medoc in 1855 classification system. 
like I mentioned, uh, and then they're divided into first and growth, second growth. I uh, mentioned Chateau de Cam being the uh, premier class, the top of the creme of the creme, and it still is. Uh, and then that the confluence of those two rivers, all the humidity and mild influence, the fog, all of that in the autumn time is what makes this possible. And what happens when this noble rot botrytis hits the berries is that as you can kind of see, it shrivels up. It dehydrates the, ber dehydrates the berries. So the sugar, the acidity, uh, also the glycerol content are heightened. It just gets, uh, um, gets elevated. Uh, and in terms of flavor, this adds this kind of really crazy type of uh, complexity where uh, you see things like honey, especially when it's aged, you see notes of honey, saffron, like dry fruit, ginger, all these uh, kind of a spicy, uh, exotic kind of a complexity gets added because of this rot essentially that, that is affecting the grapes. Um, however, this botrytis is very fickle. Uh, it does not attack grapes evenly as you saw in the pictures, uh, in this picture, right? Some of them might get shriveled, but some were perfectly still healthy and fine. Uh, so what happens is you cannot just go around and pick entire bunches like you normally would. Uh, in cases like this, you can, because everything is affected by botrytis, but oftentimes you're gonna find bunches that look like this. So um, the wine producers during harvest in the autumn time, they'll go through the vineyards and pick out sometimes each berry or just clusters of the ones that are affected by botrytis and leave it. And they'll come back a few days later or a few weeks later, just collect others. Um, so they're going through the vineyards a few times. Um, as in, as you can imagine, this gets very expensive, right? Like labor of having to send harvesters out there multiple times during harvest to just, and also you cannot just pick it. You've got to sit there and pick out each berry, berry, berry by berry. Um, so it takes a long time, it's a time intensive, it's a labor intensive, and it's part of the reason why Sauterne is very expensive. And famously speaking, Chateau de Cam, the top of the line producer for Sauterne that I was telling you about, uh, they conducted 11 passes for their Sauterne in 1974, only to reject the final wine at the end of the year, and they did not sell the wine. Uh, like I mentioned, Botrytis only happens when the condition is perfect for this rot to grow. So it's not guaranteed that you're gonna have um, about uh, actually sellable wine at the end of the harvest. So in the worst year, despite the best efforts, uh, weather and rot will essentially ruin your entire harvest. And there has been numerous examples of great estates, not just Chateau de Cam, but a great estates electing not to release a particular vintage because it just didn't live up to their standard. So that's part of the reason why Saturn is so expensive. One, multiple, multiple tries going through the vineyards, very labor intensive, very time intensive. Uh, these are all wines are also fermented and aged in new oak barrels. New oak barrels are very expensive. Um, so a lot of capital investment up front. And on top of that, there's a huge risk of possibly losing the entire harvest. At the end of doing all of that, at the end of buying the barrel, at the end of doing all the harvest, multiple tries through the vineyard, you may end up not being able to sell an ounce of that wine. Um, so all of that combined is part of the reason why Sauterne is very, very expensive uh, and also popularity and, and the kind of reputation also makes it expensive as well. Uh, New York, while rare in most sweet wine productions, uh, it is the name of the game here in Sauterne. You're going to see the Barrique, French Barrique New York everywhere. Uh, like I mentioned, it is both fermented and aged in New York. Um, they will often... Uh, and because of that, all that high elevated sugar level, on top of that, there's a oxygen, uh, uh, oxidative uh, winemaking that comes from the barrel. And a lot of the, also the new oak tannins also leaking into it. It results in this kind of really viscous, golden, textural sweet wine uh, that has the fragrance of both the new oak as well as the botrytis. Uh, and then the residual sugar level of Saturn ranges somewhere from usually to 120 to 150 grams per liter, uh, just to give you an idea of how sweet it gets. Uh, and I mentioned in the email how I find it puzzling when people are like, I don't like sweet wine, I hate dessert wines, and then they will drink a Coke on the side. Uh, just to give you an idea 
can of Coke is about 113 grams per liter in sugar. So we're talking about can of Coke versus 113 versus Sauterne, which is about 120 to 150 grams per liter. So it's a little bit sweeter than Coke, but way more delicious if you ask me. Um, by the way, here in Sauterne, even though I don't really understand why this is the case, but chapitalization and cryo extraction are both permitted legally here in Sauterne. Chapitalization is when you add sugar to the musk. Um, cryo extraction is basically when you freeze the berries. It's kind of like ice wine, but you're doing it you know, synthetically. Uh, when you freeze the berries, so the water molecules get frozen and then you keep the sugar to concentrate the flavors. Um, all that is allowed, even though basically the vineyard condition with the botrytis and what happened during the vintage pretty much dictates the success of vintage or not. But I guess just to help them, uh, help the producers kind of hedge the risk, maybe they can at least make some wine to sell by adding some chapitalization uh, to the wine or are extracting, um, but it is a uh, allowable, legally permitted process, uh, procedure here in Sultern. Uh, I mentioned Barsak being the largest commune of production, but it is, you can also call it Sultern if you want to. Uh, who makes this wine? We talked about them last time, mom and daughter combo, right? Um, I'll share the picture one more time. Marie Pierre and Bernadette, daughter and mother, uh, owned the property since 1779 uh, in Lacoste family, uh, Bernadette Lacoste. Uh, it's been in Lacoste family for since 1779, for 40 years before 2001. They leased the property out. And then uh, in 2001, they decided to, mother and daughter decided to take over the land, farm it themselves, and actually make the wines from the grapes that they grow. Uh, it's only five hectares, very small land. They do everything by animals and plowing and all of that. Uh, Marie Pierre, the younger daughter, is kind of dedicated one hectare to making the dry white wine, which we tasted last week. And the rest of the four hectares still remain for the mostly for the Saturn production, which is what we're tasting today. Um, so not necessarily the same grapes that we're talking about, um, but they dedicate, it's not like a, whatever grapes didn't make it into Sauterne turned into a dry white wine and sold as what we drank last week. The one hectare that we tasted last week is dedicated to making that wine. Um, but the fact that she took basically 20% of the family plot and turned it into making Bordeaux Blanc uh, because you cannot uh, you can't uh, label dry white wine as a Barsat or Sauterne because Sauterne is only sweet wines, uh, Appalachian. Uh, law wise, uh, is a pretty ballsy move. Um, but the rest of the four hectares is dedicated to making the Saturn wine, which is what we're tasting today. Uh, so what is this wine? It's a harvest done from September through November. Uh, from what I read, uh, they went through the vineyard seven or eight times uh, during harvest. Um, so not quite 11 the Chateau de Cam did, but seven or eight times is still a lot, uh, a lot of uh, tries of going through. Uh, obviously, all hand harvested. You cannot machine harvest with Sauterne, as you saw with those uh, botrytis. Uh, this producer does not chapitalize, so there's nothing added here, uh, except for what it is. Uh, fermented with Um They do ferment it in both sin and steel and some barrel. Um, and then it's aged in barrique, the New York, for one year prior to release. Uh, so it's 2015 vintage, so about they've held it and they just released this vintage this year. Uh, so we're talking about nine years of aging that this wine has had. But when we get to tasting it, you'll see how still so goddamn fresh this wine is. Uh, just kind of talking about the age worthiness, the ageability of these Sauternes wines. These things will age forever. Um, there are Chateau de Chem wines that are being sold on the auction block that dates back to like, 1940s and 30s and still still drinking so beautifully so it's a pretty pretty incredible stuff uh all right any question about anything i just went over before we actually taste the saturn excellent let's taste the wine who wants to take the appearance
Bueller. Come on. Do we have to do this every week? I'll do it then. Excellent. Thank you. All right. I would say this one is very clear. This one is clear, for sure. Um, in terms of intensity, I would say medium plus. I mean, it's yeah. very good. Cool. Mm -hmm. It's got some color. Very, yeah, it's gold, for sure. Um, I mean, again, gold to lemon. I mean, seen lots of Soterra. I mean, in the bottle, it's really quite dark, but I would say in the glass, it's probably more between lemon and gold yeah so i mean it's definitely to me i would squarely put this in a medium gold uh medium plus gold uh, i mean it's not it's not lemon here like it's you can tell this has seen some age it's got some age on it, so. i mean is there something in the glass in the bottle because the difference in color is huge yeah at least for me anyway yeah no no i see i see pretty pretty gold i see a lot of gold in my mind <laughs> uh any other observations i mean we're not going to do legs or tears um this is going to be highly uh viscous right because yep. of its thickness but um no bubbles um, no bubbles i mean it just looks delicious oh, yeah excellent excellent yeah it's been a while since we had a i mean this is something you should know i mean even just looking at the screen looking at it like Look at how much color there is in this wine. We haven't had a white wine that has had this much kind of a color on it. Like on the screen, it even, even looks like it has some amber in it. But, uh, you know, under the light here, it looks pretty gold. But that kind of a intense gold color uh, starting to transition into the amber, that kind of thing, happens because of the, the aging, because of the barrel aging as well as the bottle aging that this has gone through. I mean, it's nine years old, so. Definitely, definitely is what this is. Uh, all right. Dave, you get to pick the next person. Who knows? All right. Who's putting their hands up? Nobody. Julia. Julia knows. Julia. Okay. Stand by. Danny, you're going to help. Oh, you, know, you know I can't really smell. I know. Uh, okay. I didn't say Dan, I said Julian. <laughs> <laughs> nice. You weren't even on camera, Dan. I was about to drop in the chat. I was looking up, there's like, uh, because sometimes I, I have to facilitate things and trainings and stuff. And there's like a, this online thing that's just like a wheel of names that just like randomly picks names. And I was going to say, nobody tell Una about this. Uh, cause I feel like I, we have the, enough chaos, uh, in this, in this situation. I like it. I uh, like it. Okay. All right. Nose. Uh, it's clean. Why is clean? Why does sound? Mm -hmm. Intensity. It's medium plus. Yeah. Medium plus. I'm going to call this pronounced like, Ooh. Yeah. Okay. You yeah. see it? Yeah. Like this is how far it is. Yeah. Like that's insane. Yeah, I'm gonna call it pronounced. I don't Woo! know if you've ever had a pronounced wine before. And I remember. We got some pronounced wines, especially with that with that reasoning. We, we uh, okay. But, okay. Yeah, like I mean, like just give it a little swirl and start moving in, like really, like it's right there. I believe it. Yeah, like that's that's far. I'm going to call this pronounced for sure. All right. Irma characteristics. Um, okay. Floral? Um, yeah. I mean, like honeysuckle, right? Yeah. 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 To me, just like honeysuckle, blossom, just, just. Yeah. Over. Yeah. Very, very. Yep. Uh, green fruit? Maybe some pear, like really. Yeah, I get like to me. This is there's some green fruit, but like to me, this comes off as more like fence. Um, yeah, 
I mean, I was going to say that, but also only because I don't like really know what that smells like. So, <laughs> uh, I say this every year, but uh, for those of you who live in DC, if you go to the Asian collection in uh, the National Arboretum, there are mm-hmm. quite a few quince trees and then they just drop every fall. Uh, you can, like, oh, pick okay. No, uh, but yeah, there's like, yeah, but like to, to Dan's point of, Pear. like imagine like pear but like more aromatic little right. more notes and things like that but like there's definitely some of that for sure uh citrus i mean not really maybe some Like an, I don't know, appeal like a candy, peel. like a candied citrus. Yeah, thing. yeah, exactly. To me, this is like a candied uh, lemon peel, orange peel with that like sugar coating on it. That's yeah. been like, um, yeah, very like right mired lemon. If you can build that fruit, but like yeah, to me, there's definitely some like candied orange peel, candied lemon peel, like confectionery thing for sure. Yeah. Uh, stone fruit. I get more stone fruit. I get like peach, yeah, apricot, like that. But like again, yeah, there's some very like very ripe, ap- like yeah, like apricot, like for sure. I get, I get a lot of that. Uh, tropical fruit. Mm, maybe a touch of passion fruit. Yeah, I can see that for sure. Yeah, uh, I almost call gooseberry up here, but I think passion fruit is more. Uh, more of it um so again that that passion fruit gooseberry kind of like a tinge of that like green kind of a yeah uh, aroma that's from sauvignon blanc so oh, sure. sauvignon blanc, yeah flamion yeah. mm-hmm. and sauvignon blanc blend so there's a bit of the sauvignon blanc that gives it that i mean also the acidity as well but that yeah, kind of like exactly. of green passion fruit gooseberry thing that's that's all sauvignon blanc is doing with. but yes like yeah. touch of sauvignon passion fruit i think is a great call um Red fruit, black fruit, obviously, we don't we don't do that. Uh, nature of the fruit. I mean, it's ripe, ripe. Yeah, yeah, ripe to, yeah, and some of those cases like candied, but yeah, yeah, hundred percent, like really ripe, uh, really candied. Even like these, though, like I know this is like a very British thing, sultana, which is like the golden raisins, essentially. Yeah, yeah. yeah we know we watch the Great British Bake Off. Okay, all right. So sultana, like some of the preserved fruit even this like apricot for me is not like a fresh apricot it's like a dried apricot oh yeah 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 yeah. um so there's definitely some dried as well as like a fresh kind of a thing uh both the yeah. uh, confectionery thing going on here like very different different kind of layers of fruit um any herbaceous herbal thing here mm. i don't think so not i mean not that not that I not that I can get. Yeah, no, me neither. Not not it's not green like this, but if there's any kind of green kind of a vibe that we're talking about, it's this passion exactly. fruit. Yeah, it's very yeah. thing, not like a bell yeah. pepper or grass. Yeah. Um any spice or any minerality? No, uh, I don't think so. I don't get anything. Yeah. No. Yeah, I don't I don't get much spice here. Uh, minerality wise, like to me, this is just so, so like just blowing out of the glass with all that fruit and all that aromas here. Like it's hard for me to even imagine minerality on this thing. To me, if anything, that tension will come later. Uh, but on the nose, yeah, not much on the on the uh, rocks either. All right, any secondary? No, I mean. no i mean maybe i don't know with like on the oak side if i get i don't really get much yeah yeah to me there's no like even though this has seen some new oak uh it's not it's very very integrated into it yeah it's melted into the wine again it's only spent a year on the barrels and afterwards it's spent next eight years in basically in bottling just aging 
yeah. uh, and a lot of that kind of new oak things has kind of like really harmoniously integrated into the wine. Um, so to me, it's not this like overt vanilla, warming spices, things like that. If anything, maybe some like nutmeg, maybe a touch of that, but like really it's very, I, I don't see it as a new, honestly, at this point. Yeah. Uh, if anything is here, any tertiary aromas? I mean, the dried fruit for sure. Uh, yeah. Right. Just dried apricot that we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, the candied kind of like a marmalade thing. Yeah. Marmalade's a good way to. Yeah. Right. Um, anything else here? Yeah. This, like earlier, that I was saying, like nutmeg, that thing is like more of this bottle aging nutmeg, not necessarily like a new oak nutmeg. That makes sense here. Yeah, I mean, and like there's some honey. Yeah, a ton of honey here. Yeah. And even like a little beeswax, honey, that little like spicy nutmeg, but just apricot marmalade yeah. for sure. Um, uh, it's time to get just a touch of like this like marzipan. That's kind of, I kind of thought marzipan, but I wasn't, yeah. yeah. And we're getting like a touch of this starting to come in. So a lot of tertiary is just trying to set in here. But uh, yeah, a little bit of nutty sense here as well. And so this is very stereotypical what try to smell here. The honey, the candy fruits, and all of that, even gingery, little spice notes that all come in, especially with some bottle aging. But I don't know if you guys get this. And it's not just me. Like the wine people will talk about this. But botrytis, especially when it's like just young bottles, always has like just a touch of this like a cool toy, like what Dave Crowe says, the new dildo smell. <laughs> you know, that like just... Yeah, he just of... typed it in the chat too, so... <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, like it has that like, you know, first umbrella open, like the inside of the umbrella, like that, that has a touch of that. And mm -hmm. I ever get, and it just may be just the power of suggestion, knowing that this is botrytized wine. But like to me, I always get just a touch of that word, botrytized wine. But uh, obviously, longer it is it's age, more of that goes away. It's really the young ones, but I still get just a touch of that kind of like cool toy thing here. Uh, but again, okay, it may be a power of suggestion. But cool. Excellent. Excellent. Great job. Uh, you get to pick the next person for the pal. Uh, the next person on our screen is Phil. Phil, are All you right. there? Did you say Phil? Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. All right, let's do You're this. You're up, Phil. Well. I think we have to, uh, the sweetness, we have to rate this as uh, medium sweet to sweet. Mm -hmm. There you go. Yeah. It's been a while since we've had wine that have climbed outside of off dry. But this is squarely, this is not even the sweetest. The Sauternes can get sweeter than this. So I'm going to put this right around like medium sweet, higher end of medium sweet, lower end of sweet. Um, but yeah. If we're on the exam, I'll probably call this medium sweet. Yeah. And I said, uh, this is pretty good acid for a, even though it tastes sweet, it's hidden. Behind. Yeah. I'm glad you picked up on that. Move the wine around. I know it has a lot of sugar, but move the wine around and feel for acid. This got some ripping acid. Mm. And uh, low or no tannin. Uh, so, well, on, on acidity, I'd say medium plus. Uh, you know, yeah. medium uh, plus bordering on high acid, and yeah. that acid is very important. That's what gives this wine not only the the backbone for it to age forever, but the the balance. Without that acid, this wine would be just way cloyingly, way too sweet, and it would just feel like you're drinking syrup. But because of the acid, it makes it delicious, just like lemonade, right? Like. Sugar, if you just eat it on its own, I don't know, some of you think may think that's delicious, but it's just like so sweet. But as soon as you mix it with the lemon juice, it it's, brings this balance and it becomes an incredible, incredibly delicious beverage. It's the same principle here. All that sugar, 
all that sugar that's been concentrated by botrytis is balanced by that this ripping acid that runs through here. So anytime you are tasting for anything that has this amount of sugar, always look for acid. If it doesn't have acid, like there's, so if you're ever wondering why does it say so sweet and seem out of balance, it's oftentimes because it doesn't have enough acid to balance that sugar. Uh, tannin, yeah. Low or tannin? non, low or non-existent. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't get any uh, gripping. Yeah, no tannin. Alcohol? Well, alcohol, this is pretty good. I can, I can already feel like getting a buzz on it. So it, uh, I'd say a, a a medium plus alcohol, maybe uh, thirteen five. Yeah, I mean that's about so it gets about fourteen percent with uh with Sauterne. It can get up to fourteen percent. Um, so thirteen five fourteen that is very typical for Sauterne. Um, so yeah, that's about kind of medium plus range, lower end of medium plus range where we're talking right. about here. Um, body. Yeah. Body? This has got some some weight to it. Mm -hmm. uh, again, a, a medium to a medium plus. This, I'm going to take it full body. Yeah. Um, I mean, all that sugar, all that glycerol, all that glycolus in there. It gives us some. It's very textural. So it's got some. It's got some viscosity to this thing. So yeah, I'm gonna call this full. And obviously, there there are wines that are even fuller. There's some like ice wines out there. There's some Tokai that are even more viscous. But but this is definitely at least medium plus bordering on full. But it's on the higher end of the body. Uh, Moose, we don't obviously we don't have to talk about that flavor intensity. I, that's uh, medium plus to pronounce. I mean, this has yeah. got I'm very strong you. flavor. Yeah, pronounced. There's nothing shy about this. I mean, it's screaming every time you take a sip, every time you smell. Um, yeah, I definitely call this pronounced. Um, all right. Do you confirm yeah, I, all the things that Julia and Dan? I do. Out? The the, um, the honeysuckle. Uh, I you know I got that right away. That was a a good yeah. call for that, and I think I know what Quince is, but I, th you know, it's got that a <laughs> bit of a uh, uh, sweetness, but it's got a, a bit of sourness too. Yeah, I, I, I like that. I, I don't know what to. Maybe the pear also the uh, that um, Dan mentioned. I think it. it I think it would have. Um, I don't get any uh, uh, citrus, although I don't get a citrus taste. I didn't pick that up. Yeah, it's not like a fresh citrus. It's more of that kind of like marmalade, uh, candy. Yeah, kind of a marmalade would be kind of very marmalade. descriptive of it. For sure. And uh, red fruit, no. Black fruit, no. Uh, I want to say something real quick about chocolate fruit here, uh, particularly on the palate. I it just popped to me, and again, this just goes to show how limiting this grid can be. But to me, there's this. It, have you guys ever had sour sap like guanabana? Like there's sour sap quality to this wine, and obviously it's not on here. Like so, if you never had sour sap, it's a very unique fruit. Uh, it's a tropical fruit, uh, but it's called guanabana in 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 Spanish. In Latin America or in Spain as well, but uh, just go check it out. Uh, it's like custardy inside. It's like I don't know how to describe it. It's like a banana meets, but like, it's like sweet and sour and yeah. I, I don't know for those of you who can maybe describe it better than I can. I, I don't I don't know how to describe sour stuff, flavor sour stuff to people who've never had it. But um, cool. Uh, no red fruit, black no fruit. No red fruit. No black fruit. And I guess if you call the marmalade the jamminess, the yeah, uh, there's um there's a cooked kind of like a confectionery thing going on here for sure. I mean, there's yeah. still freshness here left. Uh, I wouldn't say this is just all cooked, but for sure, it's a lot of it is basically cooked. Just kind of like sultana dried, golden raisins and all of that for sure. I didn't get uh, any herbaceous, any of yeah. the spiciness. Uh, and what did you say the stone was that we that it was 
or you don't pick it up in this. I was hard. It was hard for me to get stone. Like to me, usually stoniness really comes out when the wine is really like austere um, and like acid is really ripping. I mean, acid is really ripping here, but like there's so much, so much fruit and everything here that like to me, this is not like a super mineral here. It's just more really like voluptuous. I, I mean, it's not voluptuous because it's still got the racy edge to it, but like you know what I mean. Like it just. It, it's it's just exploding with a with the flowers and fruit that, that uh I don't see it as a I don't see much of mineral I don't get much mineral. Um, secondary and tertiary thing. Yeah, well, a little bit. I I think you can taste some oak and maybe a yeah a vanilla. To tell you the truth, on the palate, I do get a, like a touch of that oak on the flavor and, rather than and, I do the and, and a vanilla flavor too. Mm -hmm. Exactly, I get a little bit of that vanilla on the on the palate. So definitely, there's a sign of a sign of a, a new oak here for sure. Um, I get a lot of orange, like tangerine orange peel, candied orange peel kind of a thing here for sure. All right, tertiary. Tertiary. Um, well, did we say there was a marzipan smell? I, yeah. I I don't get an almond taste to, to it. I, I I don't pick up on that uh, flavor, but I might say a marzipan. Uh, you know a Candy type uh, flavor, yeah. Um, yeah. To me, there's a just a whiff of this kind of a marzipan, like a baked almond cookie kind of a thing going on here. Dried apricot marmalade. This is all over everywhere. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then again, this honey. I mean, it's just honey yeah. all over. Um, Maybe touch of this like a gingery nutmeggy kind of like some sort of spice, or like a ginger molasses kind of spice thing going on. Just start to creep in. Um, this wine is definitely starting to pick up some tertiary notes here, uh, but still very much here. Like I would say the the most of it is still in the primary, not necessarily in the tertiary. It's just starting to show some tertiary. Um, the length. How long do the flavors stick around? It's got some length. Yeah. yeah. It it's it's still got some bite at the end, you know, at the end of the uh, taste. Oh yeah. I'm gonna call this long finish as well. This is this just keeps going and going. Um all right. Take it on for us, Phil. Okay. So how good is this wine with your agent? Well, I, I think it's um uh, it's got all the complexity that we need. It's got the acid, it it's got um it, it's got the sweetness. It's got the. It picks up the uh, uh, ter some tertiary that's already started. I think wow. this could be certainly could be aged because you know I uh, Saturn Saturns can be so. I'd say drink it now and it's suitable for aging. Absolutely. How long would you age for? Well, if these guys are keeping it around for twenty five years, why not? Right. But, yeah. But why not drink it before then? So <laughs> that is the one thing about Sauterne is that it is one of those wines that are that is approachable at it's very versatile in terms of age. It's approachable even when it's first made. A lot of top houses will not release it because they want to age it. But mm -hmm. even when it's first made, it is still very delicious. So a lot of it's just primary, a lot more new oak, uh, less integrated new oak, but it's still very, very approachable. It's not like Barolo or even Bordeaux, where like it has to be aged for like you know ten years for it to be approachable. Um, even at a youth, is is still very, very drinkable and delicious. But obviously, it can age and develop more complexity at ages, so it just really ranges. So Sauterne can be that, which is great. Uh, as far as the quality level, you know, you could argue that this is too sweet. Maybe sugar is out of balance, but I, you know, given the ripping acid that this has, I think it's perfectly well in balance. Sh surely more in balance than Coca Cola, if you ask me. Uh, but the concentration, we call it pronounced on both of the nodes and the palate, right? This is just right. blowing out of the glass, exploding out of the glass. Complexity, we had primary. Pretty much every primary, every class we had it, the tree fruit, the, the green fruit, the floral, the citrus, uh, right? We had the tropical uh, hitting all of it. 
We had the second day with the tertiary. I mean, it's got a lot of things going on here. And that's what Botrys does. It has all that complexity to the line. And then finally, the length, we call this long. So given all of that, I think this is squarely and nowhere to go, except to call it outstanding. This is an outstanding wine. I'll, uh, I'll go with that too. Yeah. And in order for aging, like Phil said, drink it now. I think this is drinking beautifully right now. But it has a ton of potential for aging. It has a ripping acid, great backbone. Uh, on top of that, uh, all the concentration, all the complexity. Uh, also, knowing how uh, long lived Saturn is. And this is already nine years old, and it's just starting to show a touch of tertiary. So knowing how well Saturn can age, I say this can probably go another 10 years easily, eight to 10 years. Uh, but again, drinking now, I think it's drinking beautifully right now, just to show that little bit of the tertiary. But you lay this down for another five to eight years, come back in, you know, eight. Um, this would be stunning. Uh, there'd be a lot of different things, a lot more tertiary, even more complex than it already is. Uh, but given the concentration, it probably still will hold on to a lot of that primary floral notes that are still fresh, keeping fresh and all that. So that's what we got. Any questions? Now questions. How many of you have hassle turned first of all? Okay. Some more. Uh how many of you guys like this one? Did anybody not like this one? Allison, you did not like this one? Hello. Hello. Can't hear you. Guess not. Uh, but yeah, I'm curious to if somebody who, if you did not like this in wine, why that was. Is it too sweet? Uh, is it the sugar thing? Is it something else? But yeah. Um, cool. Any questions? Excellent. Let's play the game. How much do you think? Sorry, if you are not drinking it all in one sitting, just like what's the best way to put it back in like a wine fridge? What's the best way? Just throw a cork in it and yeah, honestly, with this much sugar, like I've had uh, dessert wines just open and they're hanging out in the fridge for weeks, months, honestly, and then it never oxidizes necessarily. But if you are worried about it. Uh, sometimes it can lose some some freshness, like uh, some of the concentration. Uh, I mean, this is true of any wine, uh, but you can just put it into like a mason jar, fill it all the way to the top, just put a top on it so there's no oxygen contact, top it off, you can keep it that way. But honestly, I don't know, just keep it in the bottle. It, it's also fun to drink over time, just to kind of see how it changes. But that's what I do. I usually, I don't worry about it. I usually just cork it and keep it in the fridge. Anyone else? Any other questions? I'm just going through the chat box to see if there's... All right, and just one question. So I kind of, okay, so the, so the, the rot, the rot that makes this tasty. Mm-hmm. How common is that in like other dessert wines or is this like very specific to Bordeaux? Yeah, it, it's not very common. Uh, is it not only common because vintage to vintage is not guaranteed that it's going to happen every year, but also it can only happen in a very certain parts of the world where you basically have to be next to water. Um, so river, uh, uh, lake, um, so things like that. So yeah, it's not it's not very common. Uh, speaking of all the embassy wine things, uh, there's some embassy tasting, but it's during the day, during the week. If any of you guys want to play hooky and want to go taste some wines at an embassy next week and the week after, hit me up. I will let you know. Uh, Which embassy? Uh, I forget. There were two. Oh, one's in Austria. So Austrian embassy. Um, so it's all the timely coming after 
in the heel of next last week or last month. Yeah, there's an Austrian masterclass in a portfolio tasting by Vineyard Brands happening at Embassy of Austria next week. So, uh, soursop, yeah, yeah. And I also have a moldy cork. Wine was fine. Seemed, yeah, mine was a touch moldy on top. Very typical of something that has been bottle aging in the cellar for nine years. Um, cool. Uh, how much, let's play everybody's favorite game. How much do you think this is on a retail shelf? Remember, this is a half bottle. How much do you think is a retail shelf? And how much would you be willing to pay for it? It is still term. If that means anything for you. Thirty five forty, and it's nine years old, outstanding quality, with still another ten plus years of age ability called. 35, 40, 28, 35, 25, 40, 40, 35, zero. Kelly, all right, Kelly. Jesus, tell me how you really feel about it. 35, 23, 25, 31, 22. All right, it was actually pretty good. Maybe, maybe you are very well versed in uh, Saturn. Uh, this on a retail shelf would be 34, 50. However, Saturn of this quality, not all Saturns are great. Just because that's Saturn does not mean it is quick. There are a lot of producers, obviously, don't, don't take as much care in doing the tries going through the vineyards. So some of the non uh botrytized uh, um, grapes make it into the wine. Uh, they don't age it as long. Uh, they use as some of that uh, uh, capitalization that I'm telling you about. Uh, so not all Saturns. However, this particular producer uh, has been awarded again and again for their Saturn, and it's fantastic. I mean, it is. I haven't had a Saturn in a long time, um, and this is definitely, definitely great. Uh, is it belongs on the top tier with everybody else, and then some of the top tier Saturns that we're talking about, like sixty dollars, seventy dollars uh, for a half bottle. So we're essentially getting this at near half the price of a similar kind of rating or similarly rated Sauterne. Um, a lot of it is because this is directly imported by the, the importer here in Falls Church. They're the only national importer for the entire country. Um, so we're getting it at a importer self-distributed cost as opposed to going through another distributor Cars another markup. Uh, so there's some of that going on, but honestly, even for Saturn, this is an incredible bang for a spot. Uh, it's, it's hard to come by a Saturn of this quality at this price. Um, and that's part of the reason why I picked it. I just could not, the, just the value proposition of this thing. Um, if you like this one, that is, if you're on my Kelly and then, or Allison, and you like this one, this is- I a, like her, this, wait, why don't I like the wine? I like the wine. Oh, I thought you didn't like the wine. No, I think my um video cut out and I thought I heard you say my name, but then I rejoined uh, okay. and listed. No, 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 I like the wine. Okay, okay, cool, cool, cool. I don't know if I'd pay sixty dollars for it, but yeah. I like it. Mm -hmm. I mean thirty thirty with it or thirty-four, but yeah. Uh but yeah, exactly. The usually quality of this will get up to like fifty, sixty dollars. So the fact that this is at thirty-four fifty is fantastic. Uh Kelly, I'm curious, why don't you like this one? Don't tell me sugar because it's sweet. It's just not my jam. I right. don't. I don't hate it. I've actually had wines, wine club that I dislike more, but yeah. I would not seek it out. Yeah. What What is it about it? What don't you like about it? I mean, I just don't care for it. Is it the sugar? Is it the flavors? I mean, I don't drink soda and I don't drink sweet cocktails. Mm. Same. There you go. Um, I don't get into it either. I appreciate the complexity, but it's not what I 
Yeah. And I do get like the acid and I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, I also feel like I need the right thing to pair it with to be able to really enjoy 100. it. That's and what I, I was going to that's what I was going to ask next, uh, which is that uh, were you drinking this on its own or were you? I'm eating well, like I didn't really prepare. So I just have these um, cookies, these like sweet almond cookies from Chinese New Year. But yeah, that's the best I could do. But yeah. now I can I can cork it and put it away until the weekend and then get probably like some blue cheese would be my jam. Yeah, get I, some, did. Like a, I did blue cheese. Yeah. Get some like a salty, funky cheese, blue, or even like a really aged, like funky, gooey cheese. This would be fantastic. Cheesecake, fantastic. Um, yeah, get some, get some, try it with food again. And let me know what you think, because it, it will make a lot more sense. So Ung, I, I had think... some, some foie no. gras that we brought over from France, and we opened it up and served some with dinner, and I left some aside for the wine call. And then I turned around and my cat had eaten half of the foie gras. <laughs> Damn you, cat. <laughs> oh, wow. This is, that's some bougie-ass cat. Did you still eat what was left? Well, it was a half that I'd saved for the wine call. We don't oh, eat. whole half. Sorry. <laughs> Love it. That's hilarious. Well, there it is. There it is. Uh, yeah, it's a classic pairing, foie gras and, and sauterne. Personally, I always, I don't know, this may be just me, but I don't want to drink this sweet of a wine at the beginning of the meal with foie gras. Like, it, yeah, it just, I, to me, it doesn't make any sense. I would say, so like, have you ever had the honey wine that have the Ethiopian food? I think it'd be delicious with something spicy. Yeah, del yeah, exactly. It's like spicy, uh, but like to me, I know... The savory pairing is a classic pairing with this thing, but I don't know. I've never been a fan of dessert wine in the middle of dinner. I've always yeah. liked it at the end. Just, just my preference, personal uh, Spicy, yeah, I think it does just, yeah. Yeah, I mean, like Riesling with uh, some sugar on it. Like, I can do that. Like, a little bit of uh, sugar with a spicy food, but like, this level of sugar is like, I don't know. To me, it, it's too too abrasive it's too much sugar in the middle of it if that makes sense i Any had other? it with blue cheese but i also um had some like spicy ramen for mm. my takeout tonight um it was great with blue cheese it was weird with the ramen <laughs> i wouldn't say it's like bad like it didn't mm -hmm. clash but um but it was weird. I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. Yeah. Yeah. It's probably better with a with a like cabinet level Riesling or something. But yeah. Ooh, lovely with Basque cheesecake. That's an excellent call. Yeah. Excellent, excellent call. Now I want some Basque cheesecake. Um uh, well, I'm glad that everybody liked Sauterne, except for Kelly. Uh, but uh, I I surely thought this was gonna split the room more, honestly, to tell the truth, because I don't know. We Americans are weird about these wines. Well, I mean, it's helpful to know going in that it's a dessert wine, right? Like, I mean, like I'm like judging it in the the confines of what it is, where it's like if I'm having a dessert wine is this a delicious dessert wine? And it was like, I mean, it's better than a lot of other dessert wines I've had, but I, yeah, similarly, it's like, I'm not, I'm not just going to like drink, like, just think, just drink this. Like I would yeah. the not dessert wine, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time. Oh, a hundred percent. Like to me, this is like, I don't know, very small amount at the end of the night or something kind of a thing, at the end of the meal kind of a thing. It's not like, I'm sitting there pulling off Sauterne and pounding Sauterne with a friend around the dinner table. Like, they would, you know. Although I do think Phil just did that. Like, I don't know. I have to check, but I think he drank. <laughs> so <laughs> judgy. So judgy. <laughs> I mean, listen, you do you. If, 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 if it brings you joy, by all means. I know, I know. He's gone now, so I can tease yeah. him. <sighs> 
Uh, any other questions? Cool. So, um, 